we finally met the advancing rebel force at Kanyaru River in southern Rwanda. The rebels, many of them still in their teens, were heavily armed and preparing for battle. The Robusoro Bridge had been blown up by the retreating government forces, but only after slaughtering civilians on the river bank. Bodies were still trapped under the fallen bridge. General Kagame was at the front, preparing his troops for battle. General, where does all these ammunition and weapons come from? We buy them. We buy them from uh, the contribution given by Rwandese community internally here and in diaspora. There have been a very large Rwandese community outside Rwanda. Uh, we also capture a lot of equipment from the government forces. I see a lot of South African weaponry. Yes, you can be sure that one was captured from the Rwandese government because they have been buying lots of arms from South Africa. Rwanda is indeed littered with South African weapons. This rebel soldier is armed with a captured R4 rifle. Not far from the bridge, we came across an unusual sight. Hundreds of men dressed in pink outfits. They were all prisoners, many of them hardened criminals, released by rebel forces from a jail in the town of Nyanza. They all said they were now going to join the rebel army. We are free, but even though we are still wearing these clothes, they have promised us uh, that uh, we are free. We are not still prisoners, even though we are wearing these clothes. Are Some you going to help the RPF now? I must. The next morning, we entered the town of Nyanza, captured by the rebel forces just a few days earlier. The town had been partially destroyed as fighting between the two forces raged for days. Thousands of civilian Tutsis were massacred and their houses bombed as the militias left the town. In many cases, whole families were thrown in pits and wells. First of all, the militias, the MND militias, came and killed the occupants, the owners, the owners of these houses, and then threw them in these pits. After which, they destroyed their houses so that maybe relatives can't occupy them later on when the war is over. So did many people die in this area? And they did, indeed they did. But you wouldn't tell how many because they were all being thrown into these districts, so you can't count. Survivors told horrendous stories of the day government soldiers arrived. Habimana Nuzamihu was lucky to have escaped a massacre. Mm. So that, that very day when the, the government troops arrived, they, they, they came with the lists, presumably of those people they previously knew, to be maybe accomplices of RPF. And uh, they, they got identity cards, national identity cards from them, indicating whether you are Hutu or Tutsi. And they were all made all those who were supposed to be Tutsi were seated in one line. And then they, they killed about 10 people. The International Red Cross that arrived the day before us in Yanza to try and re-establish the hospital, emptied and looted by the militias and the government troops. Wounded soldiers and civilians lay littered on the lawn as desperate medical personnel tried to save lives in temporary wards. We have moved here from Kapkai yesterday and we have just taken the patients and we had only empty walls so it's a mess now but we are trying to arrange things. We don't have water and we don't have electricity and we took some local staff but with us and we are trying to establish the hospital again. How do you feel working here at the moment? In this very moment quite desperate but we'll try. Throughout the day, ambulances were bringing in new patients as more casualties were reported. The Red Cross expected a flood of wounded soldiers as the two armies in the vicinity 
were moving closer towards each other. Every war has its heroes and villains. If there is one champion of humanity in Yanza, it is Father Giorgio Vitu, a Roman Catholic priest. While most Westerners fled in the wake of the government onslaught, he stayed behind with his orphans as the soldiers arrived. In the end, he had to give them all the money he had to save the lives of his children. Many of them are war orphans and have no relatives left. The most difficult day was Sunday. In the afternoon when all the military were leaving the town. A group of 10 to 12 soldiers. More, maybe more bandits than soldiers came. They were detached to come here and ask for money. They came and they asked us some money. They threatened to kill us with, the, with their gun if we don't give us uh, the, the money. And at night when they left, they shot in the village. Many residents of Nyanza have slowly started to return to their towns and villages. In many cases, only destruction and devastation awaits them. Hundreds of thousands prefer, however, to remain in refugee camps around Rwanda and its neighboring states. Most fled the government troops. Many now fear reprisals by the rebel forces. Just north of Nyanza, a new refugee camp has suddenly sprung up. A flood of refugees. Every day, thousands upon thousands of people fleeing the war-torn capital of Kigali arrive here in Ruangu, trying to escape the war. Most of them are malnourished and have lost virtually everything. Yet, they are Rwanda's lucky ones. At least, they're alive. No aid organizations have been able to reach the refugees yet. They are stuck between the two armies and may have to move again soon. Some of the refugees told us that when they had to move, they had to leave behind some of their sick, malnourished and dying. We discovered them in a hall, a chamber of death, a place of unspeakable horror, misery and sadness. About 150 men, women and children strewn around on the concrete floor. Some were dying of pneumonia, cholera, diarrhea and other diseases. Some of hunger. The battle for Kigali. We were taken to the southern front on the outskirts of the capital. The rebels were advancing as the government forces retreated. Soldiers relaxed before the next round of fighting. Houses and buildings were destroyed and looted. This government soldier was honored to be buried in a shallow grave. The government forces position, it's just across as you if you check, if you check in the, in the binoculars, you can see their position. Their position is at the brigade. Do you think you're shortly going to take that position? Yeah, we will. We will. You will overrun them? Yeah, we will overrun them. Even tonight we might overrun them. But they are heavily armed? Not more than us. Have you had many losses of your own men here? Here in this position? Yeah. No, not many. And what, a, what about the government, government forces? Government, they have had a big loss because we overrun. Moments later, heavy fighting broke out. 
The machine gun and mortar fire were exchanged between the warring parties. The government forces were dug in in a small stadium a few hundred meters away. The rebels pounded them with everything they had. This mortar exploded not far from us and we had to immediately evacuate the area. How strong do you think the government is dug in in the capital? In the capital? Yeah. Mm, it's very strong. It's very strong because it seems they have put all the forces that came from the lines where we have captured. All of them have come to the capital. So it won't, so, be, it won't be easy to take Igali. It won't be easy, but we will take it. The genocide and war in Rwanda has devastating effects on its neighbors. Besides the presence of hundreds of thousands of refugees in their countries, the tide of death flows on. Lake Victoria, one of Africa's great natural wonders. But now the human disaster in Rwanda has also reached the shores of Africa's Great Lake. Every day, thousands of bodies are floating down the Kagera River into this vast expanse of water in the heart of Africa. The Ugandan fishing village of Kasanseru has become a victim of the Rwandan war overnight. Six weeks ago, fishermen found bodies in the muddy waters of the Kagera River, which winds from Rwanda through Tanzania into Lake Victoria. Since then, thousands of bodies have drifted into the lake. Every day, the Ugandan government exhumes hundreds of bodies from the lake. Sometimes, Rwandan refugees and mourners, like this Tutsi woman, come to Kasinsero to watch the men wearing masks, lifting the decomposed bodies from the boats. The corpses are taken to a mass grave four kilometers inland, where they are buried. The government has also mounted an operation at the mouth of the Kagera River, trying to trap bodies before they can enter the lake. We arrived at Kasinsero at 12 in the morning. By that time, they had already taken out more than 150 corpses. How many bodies have you been collecting? Uh, so far, we have collected about 2,000 bodies for the last uh, five days. And how do you feel about doing this? Well, I feel bad. But uh, of course, uh, I have to do it uh, since uh, we don't want these bodies to keep on plotting in uh, our lake. The fishing industry in Uganda has been virtually destroyed by the ecological disaster. Although the villagers still fish every day, people in Kampala have stopped buying fish, fearing they feed on the corpses. <laughs> 